Have you ever wondered what our ancestors would think of us if they could suddenly be here and walk among us, to see the way we live our lives, to see the way we live together as the church? I guess on one hand, I might have had that experience like I did growing up. I was blessed to have both sets of my grandparents alive all the way until I was in college and my maternal grandparents or my maternal grandmother still alive. And, and so I can kind of imagine it because that's really the role of grandparents. You are the previous generations. You're not necessarily responsible for our raising. You're responsible for our spoiling. And so it's sort of the grandparents' job to say how proud they are and how much they love the person that we're becoming. And I was blessed to have probably more of that than I needed in my life gave me the big head. But what about those who passed before we were ever born? Those of the previous generations of our family who didn't know us and didn't know that we would exist but most likely hoped for what we are and what we are becoming. To ask the question, am I living my life in a way that honors their hard work and their sacrifices? the sacrifices they made to make their way in the world and provide for their families. And it made me think about even a church family and those who've gone before us in this congregation in the generations past, if they could walk among us, would they be proud? Would they think that we made the most of what they had left us with? Are we a church that honors their hard work and the sacrifices that they made? Paul tells us in this passage from Ephesians that we are the body of Christ. And in this day and age, we're more often to relate to the other parts of our lives and other things in our lives as consumers. We're in a market economy. There's transactions. We think we pay this much money and we expect these kinds of goods and services in return. The church is called to be different. We're not in the business of spiritual transactions. We are the body of Christ. And what we've received as the body of Christ is what Paul calls a glorious inheritance. A glorious inheritance of faith. It is a profound call on what it means to be the church. It's an awesome responsibility for us. What is it that we are doing with the great gift of faith that we have been given? I ask these questions because today we are celebrating Heritage Sunday. As Ruth mentioned, it's about a month late, but sometimes we just make up our own rules around here. Heritage Sunday in the United Methodist Church is supposed to be for us to call and remember and honor our history as Christians in this Methodist tradition, and it is our 50th anniversary in 2018. In 1968, the Methodist Church that existed merged with the Evangelical United Brethren Church which were Germans, uh, they were German Methodists. They used to speak German, but now they spoke English, so it made no sense for us to be apart any longer. But that's how we got the united part of our name. But the Methodist movement, of course, began much earlier. Methodism, or the Wesleyan tradition, was an 18th century reform movement in the Church of England. It was led by John and Charles Wesley. And by God's grace and their tireless efforts, Methodist reform and revival and groups spread across the British Empire, including here in America, before the Revolutionary War. And as I thought about my sermon today, I thought, what if we took these kind of these key moments, our 50th anniversary, and so I can get away a little bit more with talking about the history of our church, but to weave it in with what was happening here at that same time. And so as the Wesleys were getting their revival started in the middle of the 18th century, Ocala was busy not existing at all. The Spanish had arrived 200 years earlier. They found native peoples who had been here for as many as 15,000 years and brought with them diseases that then wiped out most of those natives over about 100 years. And so as John and Charles were getting started in England, Creek bands of Native Americans were coming down from Alabama and from, well, what became Alabama and from what was the colony of Georgia, settling in where the Spanish had left, picking up their life as ranchers and as farmers, become, becoming later known as the Seminoles. I know that's not actually church history, but I read these things and I feel like I gotta share. 
in case you have forgotten your Florida history. And while John and Charles Wesley stayed within the Church of England their whole life, in fact stayed in England for their adult life, it wasn't possible for the Methodist groups in America to stay within the Church of England because of the Revolutionary War. Everything that was of England sort of got shipped out. And so the Methodist movement became a church. In 1784, the Methodist Episcopal Church was formed at a Christmas conference in Baltimore, Maryland. Francis Asbury, Thomas Koch were the leaders. And this new denomination grew rapidly. It was one of the fastest growing Christian groups in America as they were on the edge of the frontier and in cities and towns all across this new nation. But this brand new and exciting church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, was not immune to the conflicts that threatened to break our nation apart. Indeed, we're still not immune to those same pressures. In 1844, the Methodist Episcopal Church, just 60 years old at that time, split. It split over the singular issue of slavery. That was the only problem and issue on the table. Could pastors own slaves? Could bishops own slaves? And they didn't agree, and so we had the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. It was not our finest hour. What was happening here in 1844? This church was being founded. That very same year, the Seminole Wars that Fort King was such an important outpost on ended in 1842, and white settlers flooded into this area, and with them, as always on the edge of a frontier, came the Methodist missionaries. They had preached to soldiers at Fort King, and now they came back to form a church among those who came to settle here, beginning in 1844. E.L.T. Blake was a, I think he was still a teenager, as a 19-year-old pastor came here to lead this new congregation in 1844. He came back 40 years later to be the pastor of this church in the 1880s. In 1850, the town of Ocala was being formed, and the county commissioners gave the one church in town, the Methodist, the entirety of Block 6 in downtown Ocala. And we built a church there in 1850. If you know where the lunchbox restaurant used to be, and they say the taco box is coming soon, but I don't believe them, that was our corner. That was our corner. That was block six, the whole block, and we had built a single white frame house that stood for 40 years. Another young pastor was leading the church at that time, J.C. Lee. I spoke about him last year. J.C. Lee would go on, he would write the first History of Methodists in the State of Florida, published it in 1899, 50 years after he served the congregation here and built that first building. I mention him because he had three sons, all three of whom became Methodist pastors, and one of them served here two different times. I, I love back in the day when men went by initials. I don't know what their actual names are, what they went by, but J.C. was the dad, J.B. I'll call him John Boy Lee. He was the son. He came here in 1889, and he built the second church building on that same site. If you look in your bulletin under the 9 a.m. order of service, you'll see a postcard made of that beautiful facility, beautiful Gothic architecture. I know there are some in the room who remember it, who were a part of the church at that time. He built that building. He came back to serve again in the 19-teens, and it occurred to me as I was putting this together that the Lees left quite a legacy overseeing the construction of two different church buildings that served this community for over 100 years. Quite a gift for Ocala. And they were one of two father-son pairs to serve here as pastors. I bring that up because our next stop on our little train of heritage is 1939. This great division in our church that happened in 1844 was healed in 1939. It's the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Church South, and then another Methodist denomination, the Protestant Methodist, merged in 1939 to form what was then called the Methodist Church. Here in Ocala in 1939, we had a booming church. It had been growing throughout the decade of the 1930s. And a new pastor came to serve that summer of 39 of the merger. Reverend R.E. Rutland. He served here from 1939 to 42, and he had a couple of teenage boys with him, Gene and Walter, and their parsonage became the hangout place for all of the youth in the church. That teenager, Walter Rutland, would become a pastor, and he served as the pastor here 
from 1977 to 1982, and I know even more of you will have remembered him. So we have some wonderful connections. And then in the early 50s, our church moved from downtown to this location, and the construction of this sanctuary and the two educational wings that make up our courtyard. And so it was just a little over a decade later that the United Methodist Church was born, 50 years ago this year. And in 1968, this congregation was growing once again. Dr. Bruce F. Ganaway was finishing his third year as the pastor here. He had been appointed in 1965. He would serve one more year before moving to make way for someone named Bob Bledsoe. And frankly, we haven't been able to get rid of the Bledsoe since. When some people move in, they really move in. Uh oh. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. He says we can keep them. Dr. Ganaway and his family were the first to occupy the Turner Memorial Parsonage, who was on 12th Street, which only meant, or 12th Avenue, I only mention that so that Phil can have some flashbacks from his early life. And in the year leading up to our merger to become the United Methodist Church, the education building, the Mabel Rich building was completed. And they added heating and air conditioning to the classrooms in the courtyard. And I think we still have those original air conditioner units. <laughs> They're chugging away, keeping us cool in the summer and keeping us cool in the winter for that matter. You know, the, once you get into these, the number of stories and the different places and places you can put a pen and say, this is what was happening here and this is what was happening there and these were these milestones and those milestones. I'm really just giving you just a small little vignettes from different times throughout what is now 174 year history here in Marion County. And I did just pick a few moments that connect us to the larger story of our denomination on this 50th anniversary, but as we all know, history is far more than just these names and these dates and these buildings and these milestones, although they're easier to remember. The real history is about the countless stories of life and growth and of faith and love and most of all, the presence and the action of God that there's parts of our stories that were enriched by people who just visited here one time and we never saw them again, and those who spent their entire life here from birth until death. Our scripture text from the letter of Ephesians this morning is a prayer, a prayer for the church. The author prays that we might see what is the hope of God's call and the richness of God's glorious inheritance. And on Heritage Sunday, it's that glorious inheritance that I want us to feel that we are connected to. When I think both about our past and our future, the idea of God's inheritance is what speaks most strongly to me. We would not have Ocala First United Methodist Church if it had not been passed down to us. And none of us would be Christians, whether we're a part of this congregation or just visiting today or have grown up in other places and come and we wouldn't be Christians without the inheritance of faith that was passed down to us through generations of our parents or our grandparents by a pastor or a friend or a teacher. There's an old Hasidic tale that tells of a disciple who asked his rabbi the meaning of community one evening while they were sitting around a fire. The rabbi didn't answer, just sat in silence and the disciple sat waiting for him as the fire died down to just some hot coals. And then with that, again out saying a word, the rabbi took some tongs and took one coal out of the fire and set it on the stones off to the side and they watched as that one coal quickly grew cold and its fire went out. And that was his lesson on community. There is no solitary, self-made, standalone Christian. It doesn't exist by definition. Jesus lived out his own ministry in a community of disciples and it's a community of the faithful and the community of saints that we find our life and our community and our vitality together as we seek to be faithful bearers of this inheritance that we have received. It's in such a company that we find comfort in our losses, courage for our daily struggles, hope as we face the future together. And we can all tell stories of where our church has been that for us. We saw it 
at the nine o'clock service this morning as they gathered around Dave and Bev Brown caring for their son Glenn. But whenever we sing a hymn, whenever we sing a song, whenever we read scripture, whenever we pray together, whenever we serve together, we're doing so out of this great inheritance that we have received, that we are dependent on those who've gone before us to teach us the words and to tell us the stories whereby we praise God, where we grow in our faith, where we find a way that leads us to God. Paul tells us to think on these things, to give God thanks in our prayers, to have gratitude. And I hope on this Heritage Sunday you find that within yourself as you answer the questions for yourself, who is it that taught you what it meant to be a Christian? Who is it that told you stories from the Old and New Testament that help you learn more about God? Who is it that taught you hymns and the songs of our faith? Who taught you how to pray? Who taught you how to have have compassion in the face of suffering? Who taught you how to have courage to stand up to the face of injustice? Who taught you how to be generous and not give in to temptations either of greed or to shrink away from addressing poverty? Who taught you how to be full of joy? and to find peace regardless of the circumstances that were surrounding you. Above all, who else, who taught you what it meant to love? These are the ones, as we call them to mind, that we give thanks to God for, for passing on to us what becomes our own faith. We all have received an inheritance of faith, and we should never stop giving thanks We should remember and tell the stories and sing the songs and learn their hard-won wisdom with humility. But that's not to say that we should grow too sentimental or too nostalgic, wishing that we could somehow go back in time or try to recapture some part of our past, because that way of remembering is actually idolatry. It's not gratitude. Paul calls us to remember and give thanks, but then he calls us forward. I pray, he says, that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call. We are the future for which our forebears strove. All of their hard work and all of their sacrifices is so that we could worship together today. But what is the inheritance that we are living for those who come after us. Because we honor what has been given by striving forward to the best of what God has for us. It reminded me of Jesus' parable. Sometimes it's called the, the, the parable of the talents. Sometimes it's called parable of the three servants. It's found in Matthew 25, right in the middle of that chapter. And he tells the story of a man who was leading on a journey. And he called his servants before him, and it was going to be a long journey, and he was entrusting his wealth to them. And so to the first servant, he gave five coins, and to the second servant, he gave two coins, and to the third servant, he gave one. And each of these coins was worth about an entire year's wage. And as the story goes on, we learn after the man left that the first two servants, the one with five and the one with two, he said they put that, what they had been entrusted with, to use. They put it to work. And over time, they had doubled what had been given to them. But the third servant was fearful. And he went and took what had been given and he buried it in order to preserve and protect it. Well, the man returns after his long journey and he calls his servants forward to account. And to the first two who come and show him that they had doubled what had been given to him, he says, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been given little. You will now be entrusted with much Come and celebrate with me. But when the third servant came and said to his master, I knew that you were a hard man and I was afraid. I hid what was of value in the ground. Here, have back what is yours. Well, it didn't go very well for him. He didn't hear, well done, good and faithful servant. He was cast out of that household. He was judged harshly for doing nothing with that which he had been given. And so how are we doing as stewards of the great inheritance that we have received? Are we putting our faith, our hope, our love, our compassion, our generosity to work? Are we putting it to use in a way that bears fruit? 
Because I think if those from our past came to us today and looked around at how we were living it out as a church, they would be disappointed if all we were trying to do was preserve or protect. They would want to know, what hard work are you putting in? What sacrifices are you making so that those who come after us might also receive this glorious inheritance? What will those who come after us receive from us? Will God look at what we have done with all we have been given and say to us, well done, good and faithful servants, because we are a part of this great story, a story of this church that goes back 174 years, and together we're writing this chapter of it, a chapter of God's unfolding grace and mission in the Ocala community. In his epilogue to the the last edition of our church history that was written around the year 2000, the pastor at the time, Reverend Bill Owens, quoted the words of a wonderful, at that time, contemporary song called Find Us Faithful. And it goes, we are pilgrims on a journey of a narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. So surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all that we have left behind, may the clues that they discover The memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them each day. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Today, may we have gratitude in our hearts for what we have received, but may we hear God's call to strive forward and to find the best hope God has for us. May we put to use what we have been given. That is how we honor. That's how we best remember. But more importantly, it's who God has called us to be as the body of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.